Chapter One of The Early History of the Airplane. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Avai in March 2010. Chapter One of The Early History of the Airplane by Orville and Wilbur Wright. The Wright Brothers' Aeroplane by Orville and Wilbur Wright Though the subject of aerial navigation is generally considered new, it has occupied the minds of men more or less from the earliest ages. Our personal interest in it dates from our childhood days. Late in the autumn of 1878, our father came into the house one evening, with some object partly concealed in his hands, and before we could see what it was, he tossed it into the air. Instead of falling to the floor, as we expected, it flew across the room till it struck the ceiling, where it fluttered a while, and finally sank to the floor. It was a little toy known to scientists as a helicopter, but which we, with sublime disregard for science, at once dubbed a bat. It was a light frame of cork and bamboo, covered with paper, which formed two screws, driven in opposite directions by rubber bands under torsion. A toy so delicate lasted only a short time in the hands of small boys, but its memory was abiding. Several years later, we began building these helicopters for ourselves, making each one larger than that preceding. But, to our astonishment, we found that the larger the bat, the less it flew. We did not know that a machine having only twice the linear dimensions of another would require eight times the power. We finally became discouraged and returned to kite flying, a sport to which we had devoted so much attention that we were regarded as experts. But as we became older, we had to give up this fascinating sport as unbecoming to boys of our ages. It was not till the news of the sad death of Lilienthal reached America in the summer of 1896 that we again gave more than passing attention to the subject of flying. We then studied with great interest Chanute's Progress in Flying Machines, Langley's Experiments in Aerodynamics, the Aeronautical Annuals of 1905, 1906, and 1907, and several pamphlets published by the Smithsonian Institution, especially articles by Lilienthal and extracts from Mouillard's Empire of the Air. The larger works gave us a good understanding of the nature of the flying problem and the difficulties in past attempts to solve it, while Mouillard and Lilienthal, the great missionaries of the flying cause, infected us with their own unquenchable enthusiasm and transformed idle curiosity into the active zeal of workers. In the field of aviation, there were two schools. The first, represented by such men as Professor Langley and Sir Hiram Maxim, gave chief attention to power flight. The second, represented by Lilienthal, Mouillard and Chanute, to soaring flight. Our sympathies were with the latter school, partly from impatience at the wasteful extravagance of mounting delicate and costly machinery on wings which no one knew how to manage, and partly, no doubt, from the extraordinary charm and enthusiasm with which the apostles of soaring flight set forth the beauties of sailing through the air on fixed wings, deriving the motive power from the wind itself. The balancing of a flyer may seem, at first thought, to be a very simple matter, yet almost every experimenter had found in this one point which he could not satisfactorily master. Many different methods were tried. Some experimenters placed the center of gravity far below the wings, in the belief that the weight would naturally seek to remain at the lowest point. It is true that, like the pendulum, it tended to seek the lowest point, but also, like the pendulum, it tended to oscillate in a manner destructive of all stability. A more satisfactory system, especially for lateral balance, was that of arranging the wings in the shape of a broad V to form a dihedral angle with the center low and the wing tips elevated. 
In theory, this was an automatic system, but in practice it had two serious defects. First, it tended to keep the machine oscillating, and second, its usefulness was restricted to calm air. In a slightly modified form, the same system was applied to the fore and aft balance. The main aeroplane was set at a positive angle and a horizontal tail at a negative angle, while the center of gravity was placed far forward. As in the case of lateral control, there was a tendency to constant undulation, and the very forces which caused the restoration of balance in calms caused the disturbance of the balance in winds. Notwithstanding the known limitations of this principle, it had been embodied in almost every prominent flying machine which had been built. After considering the practical effect of the dihedral principle, we reached the conclusion that a flyer founded upon it might be of interest from a scientific point of view, but could be of no value in a practical way. We therefore resolved to try a fundamentally different principle. We would arrange the machine so that it would not tend to right itself. We would make it as inert as possible to the effects of change of direction or speed, and thus reduce the effects of wind gusts to a minimum. We would do this in the fore and aft stability by giving the aeroplanes a peculiar shape, and in the lateral balance by arching the surfaces from tip to tip, just the reverse of what our predecessors had done. Then, by some suitable contrivance, actuated by the operator, forces should be brought into play to regulate the balance. Lilienthal and Chanute had guided and balanced their machines by shifting the weight of the operator's body. But this method seemed to us incapable of expansion to meet large conditions, because the weight to be moved and the distance of possible motion were limited, while the disturbing forces steadily increased, both with wing area and with wind velocity. In order to meet the needs of large machines, we wished to employ some system whereby the operator could vary at will the inclination of different parts of the wings, and thus obtain from the wind forces to restore the balance which the wind itself had disturbed. This could easily be done by using wings capable of being warped, and by supplementary adjustable surfaces in the shape of rudders. As the forces obtainable for control would necessarily increase in the same ratio as the disturbing forces, the method seemed capable of expansion to an almost unlimited extent. A happy device was discovered whereby the apparently rigid system of superposed surfaces, invented by Wenham and improved by Stringfellow and Chanute, could be warped in a most unexpected way, so that the aeroplanes could be presented on the right and left sides at different angles to the wind. This, with an adjustable horizontal front rudder, formed the main feature of our first glider. The period from 1885 to 1900 was one of unexampled activity in aeronautics, and for a time there was high hope that the age of flying was at hand. But Maxim, after spending $100,000, abandoned the work. The Ader machine, built at the expense of the French government, was a failure. Lilienthal and Pilcher were killed in experiments, and Chanute and many others, from one cause or another, had relaxed their efforts, though it subsequently became known that Professor Langley was still secretly at work on a machine for the United States government. The public, discouraged by the failures and tragedies just witnessed, considered flight beyond the reach of man, and classed its adherents with the inventors of perpetual motion. We began our active experiments at the close of this period, in October 1900, at Kitty Hawk, North Carolina. Our machine was designed to be flown as a kite, with a man on board, in winds from 15 to 20 miles an hour but upon trial it was found that much stronger winds were required to lift it suitable winds not being plentiful we found it necessary in order to test the new balancing system to fly the machine as a kite without a man on board operating the levers through cords from the ground 
this did not give the practice anticipated but it inspired confidence in the new system of balance in the summer of 1901 we became personally acquainted with mr chanute when he learned that we were interested in flying as a sport and not with any expectation of recovering the money we were expending on it he gave us much encouragement at our invitation he spent several weeks with us at our camp at kill devil hill four miles south of kitty hawk during our experiments of that and the two succeeding years he also witnessed one flight of the power machine near dayton ohio in october nineteen o four the machine of 1901 was built with the shape of surface used by Lilienthal, curved from front to rear like the segment of a parabola, with a curvature one-twelfth the depth of its cord, but to make doubly sure that it would have sufficient lifting capacity when flown as a kite in fifteen or twenty mile winds, we increased the area from 165 square feet, used in 1900, to 308 square feet, a size much larger than Lilienthal, Pilcher, or Chanute had deemed safe. Upon trial, however, the lifting capacity again fell very far short of calculation, so that the idea of securing practice while flying as a kite had to be abandoned. Mr. Chanute, who witnessed the experiments, told us that the trouble was not due to poor construction of the machine. We saw only one other explanation that the tables of air pressures in general use were incorrect. We then turned to gliding, coasting downhill on the air, as the only method of getting the desired practice in balancing a machine. After a few minutes' practice, we were able to make glides of over 300 feet, and in a few days were safely operating in 27-mile winds. In these experiments, we met with several unexpected phenomena, we found that contrary to the teachings of the books the center of pressure on a curved surface traveled backward when the surface was inclined at small angles more and more edgewise to the wind we also discovered that in free flight when the wing on one side of the machine was presented to the wind at a greater angle than the one on the other side the wing with the greater angle descended, and the machine turned in the direction just the reverse of what we were led to expect when flying the machine as a kite. The larger angle gave more resistance to forward motion and reduced the speed of the wing on that side. The decrease in speed more than counterbalanced the effect of the larger angle. The addition of a fixed vertical vane in the rear increased the trouble and made the machine absolutely dangerous. It was some time before a remedy was discovered. This consisted of movable rudders working in conjunction with the twisting of the wings. The details of this arrangement are given in specifications published several years ago. The experiments of 1901 were far from encouraging. Although Mr. Chanute assured us that both in control and in weight carried per horsepower, the results obtained were better than those of any of our predecessors, yet we saw that the calculations upon which all flying machines had been based were unreliable, and that all were simply groping in the dark. Having set out with absolute faith in the existing scientific data, we were driven to doubt one thing after another, till finally, after two years of experiment, we cast it all aside and decided to rely entirely upon our own investigations. Truth and error were everywhere so intimately mixed as to be undistinguishable. Nevertheless, the time expended in preliminary study of books was not misspent, for they gave us a good general understanding of the subject, and enabled us at the outset to avoid effort in many directions in which results would have been hopeless. The standard measurements of wind pressures is the force produced by a current of air of one mile per hour velocity striking square against a plane of one square foot area. The practical difficulties of obtaining an exact measurement of this force have been great. The measurements by different recognized authorities vary 50%. When this simplest of measurements presents so great difficulties, 
what shall be said of the troubles encountered by those who attempt to find the pressure at each angle as the plane is inclined more and more edgewise to the wind in the eighteenth century the french academy prepared tables giving such information and at a later date the aeronautical society of great britain made similar experiments many persons likewise published measurements and formulas but the results were so discordant that professor langley undertook a new series of measurements the results of which form the basis of his celebrated work experiments in aerodynamics yet a critical examination of the data upon which he based his conclusions as to pressures at small angles shows results so various as to make many of his conclusions little better than guesswork to work intelligently one needs to know the effects of a multitude of variations that could be incorporated in the surfaces of flying machines the pressures on squares are different from those on rectangles circles triangles or ellipses arched surfaces differ from planes and vary among themselves according to the depth of curvature true arcs differ from parabolas and the latter differ among themselves thick surfaces differ from thin and surfaces thicker in one place than another vary in pressure when the positions of maximum thickness are different some surfaces are most efficient at one angle others at other angles the shape of the edge also makes a difference so that thousands of combinations are possible in so simple a thing as a wing we had taken up aeronautics merely as a sport we reluctantly entered upon the scientific side of it but we soon found the work so fascinating that we were drawn into it deeper and deeper two testing machines were built which we believed would avoid the errors to which the measurements of others had been subject after making preliminary measurements on a great number of different shaped surfaces to secure a general understanding of the subject we began systematic measurements of standard surfaces so varied in design as to bring out the underlying causes of differences noted in their pressures measurements were tabulated on nearly fifty of these at all angles from zero to forty five degrees at intervals of two and a half degrees measurements were also secured showing the effects on each other when surfaces are superposed or when they follow one another some strange results were obtained one surface with a heavy roll at the front edge showed the same lift for all angles from seven and a half to forty five degrees a square plane contrary to the measurements of all our predecessors gave a greater pressure at thirty degrees than at forty five degrees this seemed so anomalous that we were almost ready to doubt our own measurements when a simple test was suggested a weather vane with two planes attached to the pointer at an angle of eighty degrees with each other was made according to our tables such a vane would be in unstable equilibrium when pointing directly into the wind for if by chance the wind should happen to strike one plane at thirty nine degrees and the other at forty one degrees the plane with the smaller angle would have the greater pressure and the pointer would be turned still farther out of the course of the wind until the two vanes again secured equal pressures which would be at approximately thirty and fifty degrees but the vane performed in this very manner further corroboration of the tables was obtained in experiments with the new glider at kill devil hill the next season in september and october nineteen o two nearly one thousand gliding flights were made several of which covered distances of over six hundred feet some made against the wind of thirty six miles an hour gave proof of the effectiveness of the devices for control with this machine in the autumn of nineteen o three we made a number of flights in which we remained in the air for over a minute often soaring for a considerable time in one spot without any descent at all little wonder that our unscientific assistant should think the only thing needed to keep it indefinitely in the air would be a coat of feathers to make it light with accurate data for making calculations and a system of balance effective in winds as well as in calms we were now in a position we thought to build a successful power flyer 
the first designs provided for a total weight of 600 pounds, including the operator and an 8 horsepower motor. But, upon completion, the motor gave more power than had been estimated, and this allowed 150 pounds to be added for strengthening the wings and other parts. Our tables made the designing of the wings an easy matter, and as screw propellers are simply wings travelling in the spiral course, we anticipated no trouble from this source. We had thought of getting the theory of the screw propeller from the marine engineers, and then, by applying our tables of air pressures to their formulas, of designing air propellers suitable for our purpose. But so far as we could learn, the marine engineers possessed only empirical formulas, and the exact action of the screw propeller, after a century of use, was still very obscure. As we were not in a position to undertake a long series of practical experiments to discover a propeller suitable for our machine, it seemed necessary to obtain such a thorough understanding of the theory of its reactions as would enable us to design them from calculations alone. What at first seemed a problem became more complex the longer we studied it. With the machine moving forward, the air flying backward, the propellers turning sidewise, and nothing standing still, it seemed impossible to find a starting point from which to trace the various simultaneous reactions. Contemplation of it was confusing. After long arguments, we often found ourselves in the ludicrous position of each having been converted to the other side, with no more agreement than when the discussion began. It was not till several months had passed, and every phase of the problem had been thrashed over and over, that the various reactions began to untangle themselves. When once a clear understanding had been obtained, there was no difficulty in designing suitable propellers, with proper diameter, pitch, and area of blade, to meet the requirements of the flyer. High efficiency in a screw propeller is not dependent upon any particular or peculiar shape, and there is no such thing as a best screw. A propeller giving a high dynamic efficiency when used upon one machine may be almost worthless when used upon another. The propeller should in every case be designed to meet the particular conditions of the machine to which it is to be applied. Our first propellers, built entirely from calculation, gave in useful work 66% of the power expended. This was about one-third more than had been secured by Maxim or Langley. The first flights with the power machine were made on December 17, 1903. Only five persons besides ourselves were present. These were Messrs. John T. Daniels, W. S. Doe, and A. D. Etheridge of the Kill Devil Life Saving Station, Mr. W. C. Brinkley of Manteo, and Mr. John Ward of Naghead. Although a general invitation had been extended to the people living within five or six miles, not many were willing to face the rigors of a cold December wind in order to see, as they no doubt thought, another flying machine not fly. The first flight lasted only twelve seconds, a flight very modest compared with that of birds, but it was, nevertheless, the first in the history of the world in which a machine carrying a man had raised itself by its own power into the air in free flight, had sailed forward on a level course without reduction of speed, and had finally landed without being wrecked. The second and third flights were a little longer, and the fourth lasted 59 seconds, covering a distance of 852 feet over the ground against the 20-mile wind. After the last flight, the machine was carried back to camp and set down in what was thought to be a safe place. But a few minutes later, while we were engaged in conversation about the flights, a sudden gust of wind struck the machine and started to turn it over. All made a rush to stop it, but we were too late. Mr. Daniels, a giant in stature and strength, was lifted off his feet, and falling inside between the surfaces, was shaken about like a rattle in a box as the machine rolled over and over. 
he finally fell out upon the sand with nothing worse than painful bruises but the damage to the machine caused the discontinuance of experiments in the spring of 1904, through the kindness of Mr. Torrance Huffman of Dayton, Ohio, we were permitted to erect a shed and to continue experiments on what is known as the Huffman Prairie at Sims Station, eight miles east of Dayton. The new machine was heavier and stronger, but similar to the one flown at Kill Devil Hill. When it was ready for its first trial, every newspaper in Dayton was notified, and about a dozen representatives of the press were present. Our only request was that no pictures be taken, and that the reports be unsensational, so as not to attract crowds to our experiment grounds. There were probably fifty persons altogether on the ground. When preparations had been completed, a wind of only three or four miles was blowing, insufficient for starting on such short a track but since many had come a long way to see the machine in action an attempt was made to add to the other difficulty the engine refused to work properly the machine after running the length of the track slid off the end without rising into the air at all several of the newspaper men returned the next day but were again disappointed the engine performed badly, and after a glide of only sixty feet, the machine came to the ground. Further trial was postponed till the motor could be put in better running condition. The reporters had now, no doubt, lost confidence in the machine, though their reports in kindness concealed it. Later, when they heard that we were making flights of several minutes' duration, knowing that longer flights had been made with airships and not knowing any essential difference between airships and flying machines they were but little interested we had not been flying long in 1904 before we found that the problem of equilibrium had not as yet been entirely solved sometimes in making a circle the machine would turn over sidewise despite anything the operator could do although under the same conditions in ordinary straight flight it could have been righted in an instant in one flight in 1905 while circling around a honey locust tree at a height of about 50 feet the machine suddenly began to turn up on one wing and took a course toward the tree the operator not relishing the idea of landing in a thorn tree attempted to reach the ground the left wing however struck the tree at a height of ten or twelve feet from the ground and carried away several branches but the flight which had already covered a distance of six miles was continued to the starting point the causes of these troubles too technical for explanation here were not entirely overcome till the end of september nineteen o five the flights then rapidly increased in length till experiments were discontinued after october five on account of the number of people attracted to the field although made on a ground open on every side and bordered on two sides by much travelled thoroughfares with electric cars passing every hour and seen by all the people living in the neighbourhood for miles around and by several hundred others yet these flights have been made by some newspapers the subject of a great mystery a practical flyer having been finally realized we spent the years nineteen o six and nineteen o seven in constructing new machines and in business negotiations it was not till may of this year that experiments discontinued in october nineteen o five were resumed at kill devil hill north carolina the recent flights were made to test the ability of our machine to meet the requirements of a contract with the united states government to furnish a flyer capable of carrying two men and sufficient fuel supplies for a flight of one hundred twenty five miles with a speed of forty miles an hour the machine used in these tests was the same one with which the flights were made at sim station in nineteen o five though several changes had been made to meet present requirements. The operator assumed a sitting position, instead of lying prone, as in 1905, and a seat was added for a passenger. A larger motor was installed, and radiators and gasoline reservoirs of larger capacity replaced those previously used. No attempt was made to make high or long flights. 
in order to show the general reader the way in which the machine operates let us fancy ourselves ready for the start the machine is placed upon a single rail track facing the wind and is securely fastened with a cable the engine is put in motion and the propellers in the rear whir. you take your seat at the center of the machine beside the operator he slips the cable and you shoot forward an assistant who has been holding the machine in balance on the rail starts forward with you but before you have gone fifty feet the speed is too great for him and he lets go before reaching the end of the track the operator moves the front rudder and the machine lifts from the rail like a kite supported by the pressure of the air underneath it the ground under you is at first a perfect blur but as you rise the objects become clearer at a height of one hundred feet you feel hardly any motion at all except for the wind which strikes your face if you did not take the precaution to fasten your hat before starting you have probably lost it by this time the operator moves a lever the right wing rises and the machine swings about to the left you make a very short turn yet you do not feel the sensation of being thrown from your seat so often experienced in automobile and railway travel you find yourself facing toward the point from which you started the objects on the ground now seem to be moving at much higher speed though you perceive no change in the pressure of the wind on your face you know then that you are traveling with the wind when you near the starting point the operator stops the motor while still high in the air the machine coasts down at an oblique angle to the ground and after sliding fifty or one hundred feet comes to rest although the machine often lands when traveling at a speed of a mile a minute you feel no shock whatever and cannot in fact tell the exact moment at which it first touched the ground the motor close beside you kept up an almost deafening roar during the whole flight yet in your excitement you did not notice it till it stopped our experiments have been conducted entirely at our own expense in the beginning we had no thought of recovering what we were expending which was not great and was limited to what we could afford in recreation later when a successful flight had been made with a motor we gave up the business in which we were engaged to devote our entire time and capital to the development of a machine for practical uses as soon as our condition is such that constant attention to business is not required we expect to prepare for publication the results of our laboratory experiments which alone made an early solution of the flying problem possible end of chapter one